Okay, everybody turn off your microphones um, so we have no background noise. It's on the bottom left. So, guten Tag, hello, welcome to the first financing um, session we have um, as part of the ProX of Games Week Berlin 2020. This is a module we run within the Kuvadis conference, um, which is um, the core pillar of the B2B and development focuses we have as part of the ProX 2020, which is obviously happening all here, online, um, all managed through Me to Match Planner. And if you have problems and want to get feedback or give feedback, um, you will find us, the lovely Games Week Berlin team, on the Discord server. Um, here, just for the how this will work, um, it's a focus session. This is a new format we um, came up with. So it's a bit long, you might think, in the first um, hand. It's scheduled for two hours, um, which is also in the end means it's not like super strict, you need to be here two hours. So whenever you need to go um, and um, I don't know, the DHL service um, craft comes by, um, feel free to go there and come back, please. Um, so this is also the new 2020, right? Um, it's multitasking as, as at its best. Um, same with the money. Um, it's more than ever challenging to find and get uh, money sources for your, not only your game project, but also your studio, your company. Um, if you're in the position that you're not super well networked, um, how do you find people? How do you bring add visibility to your game? Um, if you don't have like the biggest pockets for marketing, um, and where do you actually, how do you convince pe people and how do you build up trust um, so that actually investors and other types of money providers um, believe in you, your team, your project and your game. For this, um, we work closely with me to match um, So everybody, all speakers have a profile, all of the business ticket and developer ticket holders and Petter has the awesome sci-fi effect um, of Zoom discovered, nice. Um, so feel free to um, arrange your meetings if you haven't done so yet and um, tag people and chat politely also in Discord. We want to um, talk here about um, also creative money, which means um, it's not only about being creative for your game, it's about also combining smartly the different sources of money, but also when it might make sense, does it make sense, which type makes sense um, for your studio, for your game, for your current situation and for your needs. And how do you pitch um, in quality to the individual target groups? <laughs> because that's um, one of the highest challenges many people don't um, have on their radar that um, sort of you address a bank differently than you address a potential backer on Kickstarter, than you address a public funding body, than you address a VC um, or a business angel. Um, so this is also a topic we want to touch and hopefully um, spark some ideas um, for the people out there and also amongst this wonderful group on, ha, ah, I didn't think perhaps we can combine this with that and see where it goes. So um, before we lose more time on introductions, I will do this quickly for you. Um, I will start um, based on my notes, not based on the screen order. So we have here Ina Göring um, from Game Bundesverband, um, the federal association for all things games, from lawyers to publishers to developers, small, big, left, right, um, purple, yellow, everybody is in game. And um, Ina is the expert on funding. So the ideal person to be here. We have Petter Hendrickson. Hi. Hi. That's a good idea. Yes, do that. I just thought I'd made one sound and say hi to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we have Peter Hendrickson, um, who's more an operational guy um, at Landfall, um, but he also um, is responsible for financing um, his studio and, as far as I understood, uh, went into business angel business. 
Um, I'm 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 a I'm part of a few arms that also fund games. Uh, quite, a, quite a few. Awesome. So um, we will hear more about that. Uh, then we have uh, Jens Hilgers. The I was just gone for everybody, right? Yeah, I'm back. Um, so there's um, Jens Hilgers. Um, there wouldn't be, um, no, that was something. Um, there wouldn't be esports um, in its type and form um, as we have it now uh, without um, ESL gaming and um, Jens Hilgers um, being part of the original ESL founding team. Um, and he's now with Bitcraft Ventures, um, investing a bunch into um, products and games and studios um, in the digital spheres. Um, but we'll see, listen, hear more from Jens in a second. Hi, Jens. Here's my mute. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, then we have um, Bertrand Vernisson from Gameseer. Um, he, for which he is the chief executive officer and the investment partner. They're pretty new on the market, um, but already have some successes such as Lin's work. So first, hi, Bertrand. Hello, guys. Yes, uh, Pere is my personal success. Uh, and I'm super happy to be here with you guys today. Nice. And Pere, go. Hello. Nice, nice to, to be here with everybody. Hi. Awesome. And now it's a bit awkward because in my other life, um, Anya is my boss and um, she is head of games um, for Kickstarter. And um, I represent um, Kickstarter games as outreach um, here in Europe. Um, and hi, Anya. Good to see you. Hi, Michael's a wonderful employee. And I have nothing <laughs> but good things to say. <laughs> good. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will dive into the first. Ah, so um, for the audience, if you have questions, there's a button called F and A in Deutsch or Q and A in English, depending on your interface. Um, you just um, put your question in there. I then col can collect them and uh, mark that we have um, are currently answering them and um, take it from there. And um, the chat is basically to give a feeling of presence. So just comment um, on what you hear and chit chat away. But questions for the speakers, please do that through the function of F&A or Q&A, depending on your language. Um, cool. So enough from me, I would say. Um, so Bertrand. Yes, right. Are you ready? I'm totally ready. There's late. There are ladies in the room, and it's a it's a guy that is starting. I I I want to I want to thank uh, Ina and Anya for for letting me start. Um, I want to thank also uh, very wholeheartedly uh, Tim and you, Michael, for organizing this today. So the topic of the uh, the topic of the of the discussion today is creative money, how to finance your next game. Uh, I think the 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 answer is actually in the title. Actually, at least that's what I've uh, went through in my whole career for now. Even though I'm 33, so people are gonna laugh when I say my whole career. But basically, you're if you want creative money, you're actually forced to be um, to be creative yourself. Um, this is what we'll be talking after with 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 Beta, and and I I thought it would be very interesting to talk about Linsworks. Uh, as a business case, so that we don't only just talk, but we also give uh, examples that we give, uh, you know, an insight on on how things really happen on the market. Um, so, if you wanted to know more first uh, about games here and the fact that we're pretty new, um, we're new to the scene or the the game investment scene, but we're not exactly new to the industry. Because we did also start a company with 5,000 euro, which we managed them to sell for 306 million. So how did we do this? Uh, we were quite creative. Uh, I, I should put it that way. But we were involved in the sale of virtual uh, currencies in games like World of Warcraft. I believe a lot of you play the World of Warcraft or games like FIFA, uh, where we were selling coins. Uh, so we understood pretty fairly early in 2005, we were just 
we were much younger, but we understood that in digital trades and digital, you know, itemization in games was something that was going to get big, uh, and it indeed became. Um, so what we what we did what we do now with all that money is we do invest in games, and we invest in PC and console games uh, from 250,000 euro to uh, a million and a half. If you have a super indie game uh, that needs 150,000 or 100,000, we're not going to discard you uh, right off the bat because you don't need enough money. We will also consider this. We'll also consider your project. So actually, there's low, no real limit or lower limit. Um, and if you have a super awesome title that uh, needs more than a million and a half, um, then you might get more from us, um, mainly because we did not raise funds. Um, we don't have LPs. We don't exactly have a traditional structure as far as the fund goes because we're just two friends. We used to, it's Michael who used to be my boss and is now my partner. After we sold the company, we decided just, hey, well, I just invest money. So we, we refuse for now any LPs and we will, uh, for the foreseeable future, refuse uh, funds because we just have already too much to invest. Um, so this said, our focus is on indie games. We don't have any preferences. Uh, as far as what we invest, it's sure that RTSs, MOBAs, MMOs, it's a little bit more complicated than heavy narrative, uh, RPGs, uh, or, or, or games with shooting elements. Uh, but everybody is welcome to pitch. Everybody is always welcome to get in touch with us. Uh, and Pera will be my, uh, my best witness here today that it's, it's pretty cool to work with us. If he trashes me after, then uh, nobody's going to pitch me. I'm going to be super sad and cry <laughs> the rest of the afternoon. But uh, I think you'll be, uh, be speaking fairly, fairly good of me. I hope so. Uh, and please don't hesitate. If in the chat you have questions about uh, what we focus on, uh, w you know, we, there will be a lot that will be discussed today. But if you have really thorough questions, interrogations, never hesitate to um, to ask in a chat. We're just uh, human beings just like you. Uh, the, we can sign stuff, which is contracts that give you money, but other than that, uh, we're just, just humans. Um, I think it's a pretty decent introduction, uh, Michael. If you want me to elaborate, uh, let me know. Um, but other than that, I think um, I'll Good be answer. answering two questions about games here, and we can move on to the business case, I think. Yeah, just one quick interruption, uh, Bertrand. Like, what do you take in return? Um, can you elaborate on sure. that? Thanks. Sure. All right, let's talk business. Um, so it's pretty easy. Uh, we invest money in your project, not your company. So this is also maybe a little bit different from, I shall say, traditional venture capital. When we looked at, tra at, at you know, how games were funded, we started last year. We, we thought, you know, people told us, well, you know, we have, we can get traditional equity investors uh, and... Uh, you have a project, whichever it is, and you need you estimate that you need to raise a million dollars. So you can either give up equity, uh, but maybe you want to remain the captain entirely. You want to remain the sole captain of your ship, so you don't want to give up equity. So what are your options? Um, you can find a publisher, sure. And then I'm not gonna. We're not here to talk about publishers today. So I'm gonna talk again about us. We want wanted to give you project funding. We thought that we need to be together in the boat. Uh, how are we together in the boat? It's basically making everything rely on the project and not your company. It means that our success is bound to yours. So when we give you project financing, we invest in your title and we only recoup the royalties uh, if, the, if the game makes money. So it's not a mezzanine financing facility. It is pure project funding. So, you know, typical example, uh, I'm going to give you a million euro for your game. If I do full financing, the maximum I'll take is going to be 70% royalties until I break even. And then we have fair terms uh, where we limit to 50%. So it's a 50-50 display. So the terms are, are they're very transparent and I have no issues talking about them uh, because as a company, you need to people need to know who you are, how you work, and, and they need to understand your terms are fair. Um, then the very big difference is we do project financing, but we there's no services that come with it. So there's no QA, there's no localization, there's no distribution, there's no marketing, there's not all of this, which are burdens that you have on your shoulders that Peras has, Peras has it on his shoulders right now. Um, so those are the elements that you don't get from us. You get a new team member, and I, I do talk a lot with, with the different teams that we, that we invest in. But we do prefer people who are ready for, for self-publishing. And now you need to be 
you need to be sure that you're ready for it, that you are, because if you go for self-publishing, it is, it is a bar brawl. Uh, and a lot of things are going to happen and a lot, a lot of things that you didn't foresee. And we're very much aware of the weight that it puts on a studio's shoulders. But if you're ready for it, if you're, if you're really, really about keeping the value in your company, not having a publisher hand hold you, and that you're ready for fight, then you should do it. Then you should take the money and you, and you should go ahead because this is the way your value over time will increase because it's your success. It's 100% your success. Pera's success is not my success. It is his success through his work, through his determination, through his energy. As an investor, I am there to spot in him his, that he is talented, that he has this seed that can grow into a magnificent tree that will generate a lot of apples. And each apple that comes uh, off the tree is a sale. It is a video game sale. And those apples, I, I suspect that those apples are delicious and that people are going to want more of it and that the, the tree is going to keep growing. But I just spotted the seed. I am not the one that is taking care of the tree. I'm not the one treating the tree. I'm not, you know, I'm just leaving the tree be. He just needed that 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 little bit of water and a little bit of push at the beginning. So I'm just being adamant about the fact that what is the difference between a project financing investor like we are and a publisher and a traditional equity investor? I hope I answered the question. So Michael, if you want me to add something else, otherwise I will move to the business case um, and introduce uh, uh, Pera. Uh, which is uh, COO and producer uh, and a main cheerleader at Linsworks. Uh, <laughs> even though I think I'm the main cheerleader at Linsworks, I think I, I qualify for this. Um, so what are we going to talk about with, with, with Pera? We're going to be talking about Linsworks as a company from the beginning, uh, the, the, the challenges that they had to make their first game. We are going to be talking about the difficulties they had to get this first title funded. Uh, we are going to talk, dear Michael and Anya, about their failed Kickstarter, and I'm and, I, and it's super cool to talk about their failed Kickstarter because it then uh, grew to be a franchise that turned into a commercial success with with over six hundred thousand sales, with like very very limited resources. We're going to talk about how this brought them to make a second franchise. Then the the, the different options that they faced, the opinion that Pera had on those options. Uh, then, of course, uh, with a sequel, when you make a, a successful game, the challenges that you have with making a sequel and how it's actually very tightly related to the funding. Um, and then he will just give his general opinion on how, I guess, uh, how it started and how it's going. So thank you very much, my, my man, for, for being there today. Um, sure. So my first question is going to be about Aragami 1 and... Uh, the difficulties that you guys had at the beginning uh, to get it funded, the issues you had with the Kickstarter, and actually how, uh, what was basically what you guys thought about. I know that this is something more than than uh, David uh, took care of at the time, but I think you have a pretty good opinion also on it. But mm -hmm. how do you react when you make a game that basically nobody wants to fund and and you have a failed Kickstarter? How how do you manage this? Yeah. So, well, first, uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I would say that, um, I mean, just as a note, uh, I mean, we started the Aragami one, the development being seven people on the team. And it was the first uh, project related to video games that everybody uh, worked on. So uh, anybody of us um, had any experience and that was, um, well, more difficult uh, at each step that we were um, moving forward, right? So I, I would say we, we, we didn't have much expectations in uh, probably any regard, actually. So we were just, let's say, uh, very happy and enthusiastic about the, the, um, the idea we had. Actually, the, the three founders of the, of the studio, that they, they just came up with the, with the idea that they are designers and programmers and stuff. And <clears throat> They had a, uh, it was kind of a, a job for the, yeah, master's degree, the, the final project of a master's degree. And, and, and they said, you know what, let's try to do a commercial <clears throat> version of it. And then th they grew up to seven people. 
and and yeah we started working on it right so it was i think that was beginning of 2014 and just six months later we we launched a kickstarter campaign and we failed uh, it was a complete fail uh, we were asking i think it was 70 70 thousand dollars and and we didn't get there so we, we we received nothing nothing and and it was kind of frustrating we were very confident on the on the project and very happy and all this uh, but for us it was like a, a hit right like it was oh so what, what do we do now i mean we 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 talked a lot about what what was not good uh in that campaign and for sure we 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 didn't put uh all the resources it would have need to to do a, a a beautiful campaign so after that we we went to public uh well the, the catalan government to to ask for for help uh because we were confident that uh, that project needed to be developed finished and and launched right so we we got very lucky because i would say each um each different administration in spain both barcelona city hall uh, Catalan government and even Spanish government helped us uh, in that regard, and we could uh, we could get um, into an accelerator called Game BCN, and we spent there uh, almost a year being kind of incubated, um, and it was at the end of that uh, incubation program that we I mean we needed more funds to finish the game because we were probably one year uh, before the launch. And we went uh, to, well, we knocked on Sony PlayStation's door, uh, Sony Europe, uh, and we, we, we went, we were lucky again. So we, we got some funds from them and that helped us to finish the game and launch it uh, in October 2016 in both uh, PC and, and PS4. So yeah, it was kind of uh, a, a bit of different agents or roles or people that, that uh, wanted to help us. Uh, we didn't get that luck with uh, some publishers we spoke at the, the beginning of the, of the process. But in the end, we, we were lucky because that other uh, partners came up, uh, trusted the project, and, and we were able to finish it and launch it. So yeah, that's a bit of the, the, the picture of the, of the first years of, of the development of Aragami. So I guess the, uh, what, we, what, 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 I, <clears throat> what, sh what everybody should take home is that actually failing a Kickstarter is not a death sentence, as a lot of people believe. Uh, I mean, there's people from Kickstarter here in the, in the chat today. We, we as investors obviously uh, take a successful Kickstarter as an extremely relevant KPI. Uh, it is extremely encouraging. It is equally fatal, so to say, for us when somebody fails a Kickstarter. So I would have probably been in the pack of people that would have turned you down. And little did uh, those people know that it would be a multi-million grossing title. So from that point on, moving on, you know, to... Uh, having those difficulties, going to the state to get money, uh, going to an incubator for money. Uh, so the Catalan government and game BCM incubator, and then in the end, having a product that was very different from what was showcased on, on Kickstarter to get this, this small investment from PlayStation. Um, you've had then success. It sold very well. Um, what is the we're, we're, at this point in time? What is the decision process when you say, okay, now we make a sequel, and and how are we going to fund it? Like, what is the internal process? What is the decision making process to say, okay, now I'm making a sequel, and I need to look for the money for it? Yeah. Uh, so yes, as as I said, we we didn't have um, many expectations in any regard, and <clears throat> especially in, in sales and success and all this. So for us, it was very simple we, we needed and wanted to finish the game and we didn't think about what uh, would come later right so when yeah when we launched the game and and, and we saw that it, it well it, it got uh, well and, and had a great reception uh, from the players and stuff and and that we started uh, 
selling a lot of, uh, let's say, units in, in the different platforms, because after PS4, we also launched it and, and Xbox One and, and, and Switch. So we said, well, uh, somehow it, it is proven that this, um, not just the game, but probably the IP is a, is a solid IP. So it, it makes sense uh, for us to keep working on it. Not, not just because of the commercial success, but also because we loved the loft in love, still love the, the IP. Uh, so we wanted to keep working on it, right? And th there were also a lot of ideas that uh, we would have loved to implement in origami that uh, we couldn't because we didn't have enough resources or time or muscle or whatever. So we had a lot of uh, ideas uh, that we would we wanted to, to, to develop, right? So that is why we said, okay, so let's keep working on, on the game, uh, on the IP, sorry. So we first worked on some updates, uh, like a level editor and for Steam and all this. And then we started working on a, on a big expansion. Uh, it was a bit of, uh, well, we had a, some difficulties there because we wanted to, to develop that, I, that, that uh, expansion in six months and it, it, it took longer than expected. But then we launched Origami Nightfall, which is the, the expansion in, in 2018. And after that, we said, okay, you know what? Let's um, keep working on the IP. Let's, let's um, work on another uh, big project. And that is where Origami 2 started. We, we started putting all the ideas that we already had in mind uh, together. We listened a lot um, to the community because a lot of people were uh, firing um, comments and, and opinions and, and we were very uh, keen to, to, to look at them and stuff. So we started building that, that project, right? And that is why we said, okay, we want to develop a far more ambitious project. And that is why we need and we want uh, a strong partner to jump on board, as, as you said earlier, Bertrand. Uh, and that is where, when we started looking for this possible partner. And we explored several uh, possibilities like publishing deals, equity investment, and finally project investment as well. Do you know more or less how many entities you pitched, uh, including us, of course? Do you, do you know more or less how many you pitched? Because they were, they we're not going to be able to say who. Yeah. Uh, but um, there was obviously, uh, I'll finish on that point, by the way, because we've been talking already for, for eight minutes, uh, 20 seconds. Um, basically, how many entities did you guys pitch, more or less? Yeah, uh, I would say somewhere around 40, probably around 30, yeah, 30 35 uh, publishers and between well, around 10 investors, both mm -hmm. uh, equity and and project uh, finance. Okay. So for the for the final final word on this discussion, I will actually give my input on actually why we decided to trigger the investment. Uh, it was last year at Gamescom. Uh, you came to us with David with a pitch. There was there there was no playable. Uh, there were barely visuals. So it was really very pretty much an elevator uh, pitch, and it was not a great presentation i keep telling you this um it was it was you, you guys presented it well but the the pitch itself was bad but the the idea was great the idea was great um and i i mean you guys were also very transparent so we knew that there were also some AAA publisher around the corner so there was also this uh and we decided to go for it because as a sequel, uh, we saw uh, a franchise being built or, or on the brink of being built. We saw an audience that was created. We saw a, a user base already there. Uh, and we saw an untapped segment in which you had certain games like Tenshu and Tenshu Z and others that were really mythical uh, IAPs in the, in the past. And we thought that there was not enough of it on the market. So a good idea with a solid team that has already iterated and shipped a title successfully on the market, willing to increase in scope in player interaction because it is a highly cooperative game on a, on a successful franchise are the 
elements that will be, it could very well be the trigger or actually were the trigger for us as investors. And the only thing that I want people to, in the audience to remind, uh, to, to remember is that this came from a team that failed a Kickstarter, had publishers turn them down on their first iteration, turned that into a commercial success. And four years later, when they were doing the sequel, raised multiple million euros with, uh, with the government and private investors. So remember that no matter the hardship that you face throughout the game, if you believe in your project, you should pursue it and it can pay off. Thank you a lot, Pera. Uh, I think we're going to yield here, uh, yield the floor, Michael, and um, um, and now we'll be uh, hearing from the other, all the participants in the call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bertrand. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just because we don't have, like, you know, the slides people can take pictures of, um, Bertrand, could you put your 10 arguments you had in the chat? Um, I think that could be motivating <laughs> for uh, um, students sure. listening um, to see, ah, checklist, you know, I've done this and that. Um, before we go into um, esports, um, just a quick question and comment um, round. So, um, Anya, the failed Kickstarter was mentioned a lot. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, so I kind of come from the standpoint that there are no such things as a failed Kickstarter, just in the sense that there's a Kickstarter that doesn't fund, but that's not necessarily a failure. And I think this is a great example of that. Um, Kickstarter is obviously like our main focus is we're a crowdfunding platform, but there's a lot that you can do on Kickstarter that's not necessarily just funding. Um, a lot of people will come to Kickstarter and they fund, but you know maybe they're struggling to find a publisher. Uh, and so the, the success of the Kickstarter, basically just having a funded Kickstarter allows them a little bit more leverage with publishing negotiations. Um, people come to Kickstarter to essentially build a community to continue to build a community. Um, I also know of publishers who come to Kickstarter and intentionally look for projects that haven't funded uh, specifically because they wanna be able to kind of swoop in and take that project off the ground. So, it sounds like this is definitely a case where having a project that uh, didn't fund on Kickstarter ended up being a hugely success story. Um, so I would consider that a success story on Kickstarter, quite honestly. Um, we, you know, we are very much tied to the idea that there's creative independence and creative freedom. And that's not necessarily just tied up into numbers. Well, thanks. And um, to Ina, um, so, Per mentioned that he was like trying to get public funding and stuff. Um, like, how do you see which role does public funding play from your point of view in the mix and um, sort of chances of getting Kickstarter project investment and whatever? Like, when would you recommend studios to go to public funds? Okay, sorry, I had to unmute myself. So of course I can like uh, speak in general about public funding more like um, about the German scene and what's possible here in regards of the public funding. Um, so since Germany is a federal state, it all started with a f like a regional games funds. So, you know, you had different um, states in Germany and some were combined where you could get um, regional games fund. And this kind of, all started in 2006. So we do kind of have a history already in, in public funding. It's not super new to Germany. And, but um, how this all developed in history, the, the amounts of money you could receive were pretty low. So I would say they were ranging between 50,000 euros maybe until like 100, 120,000 euros. And that was kind of the most what you could get from the regional um, games funds. And so that of course kind of limits what kind of games can be funded with that. Um, but uh, when I started, before I worked for game, I started at, uh, I worked at the regional film games fund for uh, media board was also funding films and um, we had only like a million euros per year for all the games from from berlin and brandenburg which was quite limited so but that was also the time 
like um, seven, eight years ago when all the platforms started to open up and the whole like, um, I would say kind of classic uh, financing, you would, you know, kind of uh, do a prototype on your own with your own resources and then you would go and search for publisher and you would usually ask for like this 100% deal, right? And then you would, um, yeah, develop the game and the publisher would finance everything. And, and so that was the classic model. But now, like some years ago, when this all kind of broke open, you know, like you had platforms um, like Steam were introduced where um, indie companies could self-publish games. Then we had the app stores, of course, installed, where all of a sudden, like this whole like um, financial game changed and the developers gained more freedom to really like um, to steward the games themselves and be at the, the first row to actually also receive the money. So that was kind of the time when this, this met. And even though um, the funds were kind of limited on the regional game funds, I could witness the first successes of indie games um, for the for the capital region. We're already like 50,000 or 80,000 made a difference to really go on and maybe go to early access on Steam and you know al already make money there. So you know it did make an impact. And um, just this year, um, the three nominations for the German Computer Game Awards, two out of them were funded by a regional um, by the regional games funding. So. When you were asking what's the impact in Germany or what's the impact on the game scene, I would say just by this little um, anecdote, you know, who's maybe uh, receiving awards besides, you know, of course, making money with the games. It is like more than half <laughs> actually have received um, public funding. And it's, of course, pretty essential for indie games companies that are small companies, small and medium sized companies. So for them, it's pretty essential and the whole, whole game changer of are we going to do self-publishing you know like really mixed everything around of course now I see a movement a lot of indie game developers going back you know they prefer to find a publisher now because maybe they've been overwhelmed by doing all the marketing work you know and they now want to have a professional partner so I think it's just really interesting to see how everything is mixed around um, so this was like how it all started, but we always, as I'm working for the representation for all German games companies, we were always pushing for a federal games fund to really finally have essential amounts of money that can be, you know, put into the games. So now um, that's why I'm here for today. Also, I'm going to tell you about the new federal games fund. And actually, it's just from the oh, yeah to, from today. It's exactly just one month ago where the whole application round started with the big uncapped um, fund. So, and uh, the new German games fund has 50 million in store for every year. It already started last year with like a pilot funding round, and for now we prolonged it until the year 2024, it's already secured. So we'll see 50 million budget for game companies that are located all over Germany. It's not limited to any to any state. So this finally is like yeah, the money <laughs> that the companies need because it has no cap cap. When you um, ask for production funding, um, you know, the, the cap kind of is it's 50% yeah, of the overall total costs of the project but this can be yeah more than millions like if you have a project that costs two million for example and um, the rate is 50 percent so you can have a million euros um, from the public fund and after that it kind of decreases until the project costs like eight million euros and then it finally settles at 25 percent so this is like the basic how it works and it just started. So everybody in the German games development scene is pretty excited about applying and yeah. Now we, we will go into details on that also tomorrow, um, a deep dive into Große Bundesförderung. Mm -hmm. So um, remember that. Um, just a quick side note before I ask Petter some questions. Uh, when um, Gamesia was in the media, like this is the new fund, project fund uh, based in 
Germany, I thought, okay, they're just doing it because of the große Bundesförderung <laughs> to sort of um, fill the gaps for the private equity, smart combination, you chip in two million, you get another two million and you bam, have four. Um, have fun. Um, <laughs> but we can come back to that uh, later, Bertrand. I just want to loop in the groups. Um, so, um, Petter, we um, don't know where you fit in um, yet. Um, are you a gap filler? Are you a business angel, seed investor? Um, I know Landfall is financed itself, but um, on your outgoing parts. Um, so, so. So um, where do we fit in? So Landfall is a self-owned, self-published studio. Um, and we became that by choice eventually. So I, I have traveled around and, and talked shit about the concept of publishers and how uh, the model of publisher is like, it's, it's not fully fair to what they do because most people get a publisher because of the financing. Um, and then the, the type of investment I, we do is, is similar to what, to what Betran is talking about when it's just money and nothing else. Um, so I think I think me and Betran and Gims here have like a, a similar similar fit in, into this space, I guess. Which uh, ticket sizes do you have? Um, so on, on Landfall, we just found games that, that are kind of the games that we see ourselves doing in some way. So it's just like, we see a game where we're like, oh, we could have been been doing this ourselves, and therefore we understand how to make it and how to market it, and therefore we sign it. Uh, but but we also don't take the publishing rights, and there's a whole bunch of super interesting tax questions re regarding that. But, uh, but but yeah, any game, any size, just it needs to be a game that we can help, um, and then we will fund it. Okay, cool. So personal relationships, that's um, one of the keys, right? Yes, or for us, it's um, actually giving value. Um, like, why should we take our money and not someone else's money? Uh, and why should we spend time on this one and not something else? And then okay. it's a better investment to spend time on something that we could uh, give more to than just money, um, than, than money. Okay. We will um, see, so please, um, people, if you have questions, use the Q&A um, section. Um, Jens, uh, your big time is coming up um, for diving into, uh, I guess, also different types. Like now we are more on the development um, funding. Um, Bitcraft is part of the games industry for sure, um, but this also shows how broad the games industry is, right, what you are doing. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here. And um, uh, just, just clarifying here. So if I look at the attendees tab in Zoom, that's the kind of people we have right now kind of listening to us, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, so we, we have about 25 people here as far as I can see, which is great. Like just, just provide us your feedback right away and, and sort of don't hesitate to stop even me when I walk you through a couple of slides that um, the conference here, Games Week Berlin, has asked me to provide you with and, and prepare for you. So topic, obviously, is sort of um, investing in games and, and how do you obtain capital? What kind of capital is available? Um, let me just see if I can share my screen right now. Um, up, up, up. Start the presentation here. <clears throat> Where's the play button? Here it is. Hopefully somebody enabled my screen share. No, host disabled participate screen sharing. Now that's off to a bad start. Can somebody change that? Just asking for a friend. Please host. I'm only co-host, so host needs to do. Okay. I still am not allowed to share anything which is probably bad because the, the attendee number will drop unless I'm really entertaining while I'm trying to share my screen. Um, but we're going up a one already. <clears throat> yeah, so they, they heard there's pr trouble. There. Okay, so, so whoever is the co-host, tell me directly once you enabled my screen share and I'm just gonna start talking in the meantime. Let me move over my presentation to the other screen. So I have it next to me and I can start already. 
Um, so Bitcraft is a venture capital fund uh, that was established in about 2015 uh, by myself. I'm, I'm sort of an entrepreneur in the esports and game space, uh, developed my passion for video games, particularly with a game called Quake. And here we go. I got a message. Yeah, it works. Fantastic. Sorry, I just got started and now I can share. I'm moving it back. Don't want to waste your valuable time here, but this here should work. So hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. Can somebody confirm that? Yes, that looks good. Okay, wonderful. So um, um, Bitcraft in a nutshell, what are we? Um, we invest sort of in um, gaming, esports, and interactive media. Esports is sort of the segment that I particularly with my entrepreneurial history come from as I just sort of, uh, uh, where I just stopped, I sort of got kind of mostly um, inspired to start building a company with a game called Quake, uh, which was a very life-defining game for myself. Played a lot of stuff before, but Quake was the game that really inspired me to kind of build in competitive multiplayer games and build in particular what you probably have been hearing of as ESL or Electronic Sports League, which became sort of the largest independent league for professional gamers worldwide. So I exited that company in about 2015 and at that time about started to invest first with this core scope in esports and and sort of during the last years we've broadened our mandate and are investing in gaming which includes studios which includes what we call ip intellectual property and games um and uh, in interactive media a couple of examples I'll, I'll bring up later now we invest in sort of uh the stages which typically would be defined as seed to series b now for those not too familiar with venture capital terms the seed stage is typically that stage where you would say like hey i have a sort of a, a product available already that's being used or a product or a service that's being used by a number of customers or um uh, consumers or, or business customers already and i see first kpis typically that's what we would call the seed stage where the company would kind of take in additional capital at that point to prove out that there is more scale to what they do um, in kind of a games ip directly in a studio which develops a game that would be like hey i have a first version of the game that i have in an alpha a close beta i see first user metrics i can see retention rates, I can see sort of stickiness of users, I can collect qualitative feedback from the first 100 or 200 users. And, and here, I want to kind of spend additional capital to kind of continue with the milestones on my feature roadmap for the game or studio. And I want to kind of um, prove that I can go into user acquisition at scale and, and ultimately prove that my sort of customer lifetime value is larger than my customer acquisition cost for the game. Ideally, you don't even have a customer acquisition cost. That's the most beautiful case, obviously. Um, now, Series B on the very other side of the spectrum is sort of where you kind of have growth already and you're sort of expanding beyond your core products. You're sort of kind of securing an entire market and, and typically Series B would be kind of 15 million US dollars plus in, in financing size. So we, in average, invested about 2 million US dollars in individual companies in the kind of initial stage when we invest in the company in our more than 50 investments that we did in the last uh, four years. Our thesis, what we believe in when we look at games, esports, and interactive media, there's sort of an, a bracket around this. There's sort of something that holds all this together and lose all this together is what we call synthetic reality. Um, we believe um, that video games, which sort of, I, I would like to call them simulated realities, alternate realities, digital realities are starting to merge and blend and become one increasingly with the physical reality we have around ourselves and, and that we are sort of so used to. That particularly happens with digital natives. I like to call myself, or I feel like I was one of the first kind of digital natives. Like at that time they called me, like I would be looked at as a real geek or nerd. Like, I didn't see the line really anymore much between the friendships I built in Quake or the stuff I built in Quake and shared with my friends in IRC with what I did in school or in university. So, so this is where we believe society at large is heading. Um, and this is what we believe is sort of the impact and imprint that gaming, uh, esports as a part of that and interactive media bring, bring forward. And that's what we're investing in. Um, as founders of this fund, including myself, we're very entrepreneurial. Um, we've built companies before. Um, we've expanded companies globally. We've scaled them from kind of three, four, five first employees to hundreds of kind of staff um, and exited companies. Um, so we're sort of not 
coming from a banker, we're not kind of having a background where we, we kind of grew up as analysts, associates, or principals in a bank or an investor already. We've been building companies before. And it was my very own experience in taking on venture capital in ESL, where I had like more than four rounds of funding in that company in the first 10 years, uh, kind of from angel uh, funding to kind of institutional venture capital, where I felt like the people I had, which were great investors, uh, particular, like, like that really helped the company to some extent, but I was surprised on, or, or let's say sometimes a bit discouraged by the fact that I had to re-explain and re-educate kind of some of my board members or some of my investors over and over on what actually are we doing in games? Like, how is this industry functioning? Which is something that if you have an investor that invests in many different sectors and not only speci like, like specifically in games or your industry, um, it's, it's sort of, it's a different level of support and a different level of interaction that you might actually have with them. So I, I was a strong believer that sort of building a fund, uh, a venture capital fund and building financing instruments specifically for the games industry would be something that kind of entrepreneurs that build companies would appreciate. Um, with our founders, with our partners and our team, we have a fairly large network and experience in the space. I'm doing this for more than 20 years now. I built sort of our business in Asia and Europe and in the US, we have our entire team of now nine people distributed around the globe in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, New York, London, Berlin, and Lisbon um, and Madrid. So this is all the cities where we are. Like we live in Zoom, the place where you're following me right now. This is our sort of co-working space, mostly like COVID didn't change that in any way for worse or for, for better. Um, uh, we are an equal partnership. That's something you should know what that means. Um, in venture capital, uh, the people that run a fund kind of have their upside and sort of their kind of real payout, mostly based on what is called a carry. The carry is a profit share on kind of anything that they invest in where they will get a part of the profit. In most of the funds, the individual partners will kind of get the biggest share of the profit on the investments that they make. So if I would invest in your company and your company is successful, the biggest part of the profit of that successful investment would go to me and not to my partners. They are incentivized mostly on their investments. In an equal partnership, the partners share equally in the success of the companies we all invest in, which we believe is a great concept and kind of for a fund like ours, the better concept. And for you as an entrepreneur, the better concept, because you get the support from all of us and not predominantly from one individual partner. We're international. I already mentioned that we're decentralized. We're international. We work in Asia. We work in Europe. We work a lot in North America, which also means we get a lot of data points from all these parts of the planet. Uh, we kind of learn a lot from all the different companies we're invested in, but also the partners we invest with. Um, and that can go to, an, to the advantage of a startup that plans to roll out stuff internationally. Portfolio, I mentioned, we get about 50 companies we invested in the last four years now, uh, a fairly large portfolio that also provides a lot of synergy. Our portfolio founders and CEOs work fairly closely with each other. And we get a fairly international LP base. Our kind of the capital that is in our fund, which is more than 180 million US dollars that we sort of deploy is from an LP base, from a limited partner base that is out of uh, the United States, Europe, Northern Europe, Western Europe, um, uh, Japan, Korea, um, Hong Kong, um, CIS region and the Middle East region and Latin America. So it's a very global base of investors that invest with us. One thing that I believe makes us stand out is we pay a lot of attention to our brand name. That's this logo that you see here, Bitcraft. Um, we believe in order to find the best companies and to kind of help the companies best, you got to be stand for, standing for something. You probably heard of the name Sequoia. Sequoia is a very well-reputed brand in venture capital. Like you have traditionally understood if Sequoia chooses to partner with you, then your company sort of has a seal of approval because these guys invest in some of the best and have invested in some of the best companies and most successful companies globally. We believe Bitcraft is such brand and we work hard to build that. The benefit for an entrepreneur is like Bitcraft is sort of a bit like a seal of approval of the quality of the company because um, we sort of have a fairly good track record in what we did in the past. That said, you hopefully understood to some extent what I do. I'm just gonna quickly switch back because I told you guys to ask me questions. And if I see any, I will absolutely make sure to answer it right away. And anybody else, please do the same on the panel as well. Stop me if I tell nonsense or there's anything I should go deeper in on. So what do venture capitalists look for? Um, what does like, uh, what's that work like? And, and you've, you've heard before that there's various different types of financing. So what I'm gonna sort of talk a bit about here is 
particularly applicable for venture capital. Um, there's like, there's angel investors, there's a large amount of family offices, which invest in games in the meantime, which have their own dynamics. There's uh, project-based financing, there is kind of uh, government and, and sort of uh, uh, support programs, structural support programs. All of them have their own kind of way on how they work and you have to learn about and understand, here's how venture capital sort of somehow works. I simplified this part here because one thing that I believe is incredibly important is that a company that seeks for capital should be street smart. And a lot of the stuff that I'm explaining here, you can just Google and there's like plentiful of resources that explain it really well, better than I could ever do. Here's in a super simplified way, what venture capital looks for. Venture capital looks for great product, a great market and an amazing team. In the different stages that venture capital would invest in, this here I found a particularly helpful and interesting um, and, and useful kind of graphic. It shows with the different kind of stages of venture capital when investing, kind of what an investor looks for. Pre-seed, I mean, I, I explained to you guys what seed is, right? And what like in the seed phase sort of is important. And then you see that again here, traction, which you can also associate to some extent with product, or if you're a game developer with game, like your, your first product is your first game. And what an investor would like to see at the seed stage, at the seed financing stage is like, is that game already showing traction, right? Like, is there already early indicators of that product starting to work or not? That is the most important kind of aspect that an investor will look at uh, at, at that point in time. Um, and and when, when I say the most important one, like, don't take everything I say absolutely binary. Like this is like a tendency that that is something that you should pay much or most of your attention on. At the pre-seed level, before you even have a real product, like Bertrand said, like when he got a pitch from, from um, um, uh, forgot the first name, um, um, from, from, from the company you invested in Bertrand, you, you didn't have a product, you didn't have traction, you invested at the pre-seed stage, you didn't really invest because of project financing, but the team was what matters and that's what you clearly laid out, right? Like the, your conviction came not so much because of the product to begin with, it, became, it came uh, from, from the team that you have seen on the other side and the vision that they presented. So the, the priorities and what's important and what's relevant when we look at the different kind of financing stages kind of flip and change over time. And in the series A kind of where basically at that point in time, you've proven the product, you've acquired a critical amount of users and now it's about absolute scale with a lot of kind of customer acquisition and customer lifetime considerations. It's all about how deep is that market that you can serve. That's why market here at uh, position number one in the series A much more important. So I, if that, I hope that picture is clear what it tells you if you go out there and raise funding and, and you sort of define your funding, right? How much capital am I raising? What point am I at? Like, this is the factors that you should always keep in the back of your mind that you need to double down on and need to make sure that that will be looked at fairly, fairly closely. That said, there's a couple of things when fundraising that I find not so obvious that maybe are not talked about so often that I wanted to focus a bit more on in this kind of session here. And that's that I think you can increase your chance significantly with really good process in your fundraising and preparation. And by the way, that obviously also applies to uh, the category of Kickstarter financing. But so what is, how, how's, that, um, how's that kind of uh, to be understood? Um, it's very important that you understand what kind of VC you are talking to and when you are talking to him in detail. Like, um, understand what is the fund scope? Like, is this a generalist investor? Is that a sector specific investor? Is that an investor who invests only at the early stage or only at the late stage? Do your diligence, right? The funding stage is important. It's also important, and that's something that an entrepreneur doesn't see at first glance. What's the fund lifetime? A venture capital fund typically lives for about 10 to 12 years. That is the time span when sort of the capital that the fund has deployed over the early time period needs to be repaid or should be repaid to their investors in an ideal world, which means a fund, a venture capital fund deploys most of its capital at the early stages in the first two, three, four, five years and sort of follows on potentially starting in year three of the fund lifetime. But if, when you talk with investors, understand what is the fund that's investing in me? What is the fund lifetime to understand what kind of the interest on the other side is, or probably even the pressure on the other side is, or the limitations is on what they can still invest and, and how much they can still invest. For example, to, to double down on that, it might be 
it, it might be worse if you get an investment from a fund in year five of a fund that has a 10 year lifetime, because the fund might have to try to get out of your company five years later already, right? Um, so the person you talk with is incredibly important. Of course, you would like to talk with a person who makes ultimately the decision for your investment, which might be the partner to most of, in most of the cases. But um, at the same time, it might be a good idea as well to build up a relationship with an analyst, which is sort of the, 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 the um, most junior position in a venture capital fund. Build a great position. Analysts or associates can be great champions for you in a fund. But if you not talk with, if you don't talk with the decision maker right away, then obviously it's going to be kind of a bit of a different process. Yeah, a process that you can make work in your advantage. Just be mindful. Who are you talking with? What is the process internally in the fund? What do you need to deliver to that person in order to make it kind of best fit and 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 best success? I think something also often underappreciated is DNA and culture of the fund. Just like any company, your company has a certain culture, and uh, uh, funds. Venture capital funds are not just like bank accounts. They also have a culture. And I mentioned some of that with Bitcraft to you, we're a very entrepreneurial driven fund. So that's a different, not necessarily different, but maybe a bit of a different color in your conversation that you can have or would have than if you talk with a fund that consists out of, I don't know, just McKinsey people to begin with, or former investment bankers to begin with that didn't build companies themselves or haven't even been part of the games industry themselves before. So find that out, kind of understand what the other side is like, what their culture, what their DNA is look like and, and find the right language and choose the right language. Try to find out, that's not easy, but it's very helpful. Um, try to find out how much of deals does the other side have going on right now? Is there capacity? Like ask a question like, like, are, are you actually able to kind of work on me, uh, with me on my company here in the next one or two months and come to a potential investment? Or is there other stuff that you have on the table? Because if a VC who can only make that many investments a year, typically, has their capacity reached with deals they have on the table right now, then you, you might just choose to put your priority on something else, right? And ideally, you have a partner or a firm on the other side that's honest about it and makes you aware of that. I was in a situation where I was raising for one of my companies and like I, I basically got sort of declined and it was what was a good, dis, uh, good discussion after all. And, and I think we could have made an investment, got an investment there because the other side was just busy with a deal that they had higher priority on and, and, and kind of needed to focus on. Macro environment, um, what is the environment out there in everything or in a lot of sectors outside of gaming, the last months were frothy. Not a lot of capital has been deployed because sort of we're in the middle of a crisis and that's when you can expect that an investment process could take longer. Games, fortunately, were fairly unimpacted by that. I would even argue the opposite uh, to some extent. Um, and consider the overall timing of your race. When are you going out to the market? There's principally, if you want to master this, there's three windows where you should go to the market to raise capital if you do a sort of structured capital raise. That's sort of in the early part of the year when people come out of their holidays, kind of end of January, February is when you should start a fundraise. Then you have like two, three months of time until sort of about Easter. After Easter, another window starts until summer holiday, which in the US, by the way, when you talk with US investors, starts a bit earlier than in Europe. They kind of go on their summer holidays already middle of July. And don't get me wrong, like that doesn't always break a deal. But I'm just saying like the ideal scenario is you time these windows and the next window after is sort of September to December. So if, if you would go out to the market right now with a company for a new fundraise with an investor, not great timing, right? So the chances you get to a deal is smaller than if you had started one and a half months ago, if we don't consider any of the other factors right now. I'm just going to pause here because if I talk too much, you guys kind of throw stones at me or virtual stones or whatnot. Here's a question. Could you define the KPIs which are relevant for traction? Yeah, that depends on the company, right? Like, like in, again, we invest in lots of different things in in in, in gaming, esports, and interactive media, like we invested in the company that fixes latency issues for game developers. Like if you're a game developer, like you 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 contract their, you get their SDK, you go on their platform, and they they accelerate your traffic without you having to kind of close any agreements with Akamai or whatnot because your AWS sucks, right? So so this is a company where there's a different KPI that matters and defines traction than if you are a game developer and develop I don't know um, an RTS uh, on PC. 
Um, and 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 there is a different KPI than if you, I don't know, are we invested in an influencer and talent management company as well as part of this space, and and that's a different KPI. So very very kind of different factors that sort of all of this depends on for a game developer seed stage i think kind of retention and stickiness like the engagement of a player and consumer with your game is up and by far the most important factor so make sure that there's a concrete fit when you go out there like do these people invest in your industry like there is actually investors that are just curious like Hey, yeah, I'm so like, like you're a games company. Of course, I want to talk with you. But at the end of the day, they've never invested in a game studio. You might be the first ones. Like that's a different pitch you need to take if, if you sort of have sort of the, if you're the first games investment for, for a fund, do they invest in your industry? We would be a firm where you check that box like with, with three checks, right? Um, do they invest in your stage? You're going out for a series A, like a lot of funds might not get there or it's even too early for some funds. Make sure they invest in your stage. Do they invest in your model? A lot of funds focus just on consumer facing product. A lot of funds just focus on kind of SaaS or, or just, just, just kind of uh, uh, non-consumer stuff. Like there's different models that funds optimize for. Make sure you fit in there. Do they invest in your country? Like the challenge that a lot of ga German games entrepreneurs are, have is that there is a lot of capitals in the market. Like I think if you're a great company, you will definitely find capital day and it's easier than it was like, like pretty much all the time before. But a lot of that capital still sits in markets which are not Germany. I'd say Germany has improved substantially, but it's still sort of not the greatest fundraising environment. So if you look at funds outside of Germany, there's actually a substantial amount that would not invest in your company if you're inside of Germany and a German limited liability company as is most likely. Um, and, and I mean, I've just been through three funding rounds in Germany and sort of this is my complaint to the German authorities. Like the German notary system is very off-putting for a lot of VCs, particularly those from the US, simply because they they do it once in DocuSign and you're done with everything and you get your share certificate here in Germany. Like, and at this stage where you can't even go to a notary, it's a nightmare, right? So, so like a lot of people and particularly US investors will sort of be more likely than not, not invest in Germany. Make sure they invest in your country. Make that an early question. Another one, do they lead or do they follow? You need a lead investor for your round. Is the investor you're talking to the lead that you need? Can they lead? Kind of structure your fundraising approach and your discussion around with them around what they are. The most important thing you need to have a successful funding round is the lead, the person who will negotiate with you the terms of a round and who will step forward, provide you a term sheet. And most, most often kind of take the biggest part of the financing. This is called lead investor. This is what you need first. Follow on investors easier, way easier to find once you have a lead. Are they conflicted? Like what I've always done, I've always went to the website of the investor first and checked their portfolio. Is there anything in the portfolio that I feel is fairly similar to what I do? Super easy exercise. You want to do it and you, you, you should probably still take the call um, because you never know, but like, like maybe that company already pivoted away from that or whatnot. But just make sure that you understand if there is a potential conflicting investment and ask the partner on the other side, the kind of person on the other side, like, I saw you've already invested in this and that. Like, do you think that's a conflict? Is there anything where you feel like that's a synergy? Like, like how do, does that work out with, with two of these companies? Um, do they have capacity? I said that before. Make sure they can work with you on a fixed timeline and, and sort of satisfy that timeline of yours. So this is just some things which I kind of oftentimes when I get approached by an entrepreneur, they seek financing, I feel like somebody could have done a better job at kind of checking all these boxes and made his life way easier. And, and many of these things you can solve in two, three, four, five hours max and improve your chances for a successful fundraise significantly. Um, and again, guys, if I talk too much, you guys, kind of stand up and shout, right? So here's the last part of what I've prepared, what I look for. So this is my personal stuff. Because I, and like I said before, every VC is a bit different, right? So what I really like is I like a great deck. I like a really great presentation deck. For me, the presentation deck is the first thing I see of a company. And the presentation deck of whatever that company is doing there on the other side is like the resume, is like the, the best resume I can get from a founder or founding team. It's like, for me, the deck represents the skill, the sales skill. Like as a CEO and entrepreneur, you need to be able to sell. Like it, your game is 
to some extent, something where it has to sell itself, right? So you you have to understand the art of selling to some extent. Your deck is a representation of that, of your ability to sell as a CEO. When you hire talent, by the way, for your company, which is so important, you sell. You sell your company to somebody who's going to apply and hopefully work for you. A CEO has to be able to sell. And a, a, a presentation deck that we get first is a great representation of, number one, the ability of somebody to sell. Number two, the representation of structured thinking on the other side, does somebody has have a methodology and a structure to their approach? And can somebody kind of, as, as Einstein said, like if you can't kind of express the problem in one sentence, you probably didn't understand it. Can somebody abstract the problem or the solution he's pre presenting into a very simplified format, which I think is sort of great, uh, a great skill set to have. And I think a deck for me represents all of that. Like a, a deck also tells me a lot about the strengths and the weaknesses of a founder team already. So for me, a great deck, um, and, and by the way, a deck might be ugly, but therefore might be amazing on the content, right? The deck is the founder founder's resume. And I, I love a great deck. I really do. Um, a snappy founder and a team that delivers. Now, I have to say, for me, myself, I try to be snappy and fast. When I get an email from somebody, I always try to answer within those 24 hours or, or a message or whatever. From the founder, I expect the same. You go into a relationship, you want to get something done. Like, here's a question that we have. Um, respond. Respond fast and respond with quality. Keep the ball rolling, right? Um, that for me, and because I always think like the way that a founder is interacting with me is what that guy is running his business like. So if a founder takes like three days to deliver a simple retention chart to me, I'm like, really? Like, how, how does he do his analytics in a fast moving environment internally if he can't even deliver that to me in three days? Like either he doesn't have the numbers or the numbers are shitty or the guy doesn't have his act together, right? So kind of fast delivery, kind of be on the point, be snappy. I think that's to the point as well, well-structured follow-up material, um, intellectual honesty, I'm a very candid person. You probably already see that here on the microphone. Like I'm very straightforward. I, I love intellectual honesty. I think great results come from kind of people discussing candidly with different opinion, different viewpoints, kind of complex subject matters and come to great conclusions. I love founders that put their ego and their emotions on the side, just as I do, and kind of focus on like, we want to create a great company here, of course, with passion incredibly passionate about what we all are working in and what's in front of us with the games industry and esports. But still, we want to be successful with our resources, with our money that we invest. And like, so let's let's be straightforward and kind of have meaningful discussions without any politics in between. Intellectual honesty is a beautiful thing. And the best founders we have kind of are always willing to say, just like I myself, by the way, I make so many mistakes and I'll like if I have a discussion with a founder and I told him like five times, I told you that, right? Like, I just, I just don't think it's a good idea. And at the end of the day, I'm wrong. I'll say like, you know what? I fucked up. You were right. Like, and I learned something. And I think that's incredibly important. Team readiness. Like, it, like the last years, last three, four, five, six years with a bit more of, I'd say kind of, I don't want to say abundance, but like, I think venture capital kind of getting a, a, a more of a commodity I felt like there was also a bit like like building a company is like a lifestyle thing, you know, like, well, I'm, I could just build a company because everybody builds a company nowadays. No, like if you want to be successful and you take other people's money, understand that you're moving to war. Like, like there is no such thing as like, well, yeah, that didn't really work so well. Like this is not a sprint. It's a sprint marathon that you're getting into. If you want to build a billion dollar company, if you want to build a hundreds of millions of dollar company, if you want to create a game that can rival League of Legends, if you want to create a game that rivals kind of uh, Candy Crush Saga, like you have to be ready to go out to war. And if you don't understand what that means and all the hardships, and I can tell you like my, my entrepreneurial time over 15 years, I was bankrupt like 10 times. And, and I've kind of, been, been working of nothing for months and months and months and, and kind of paying my employers over myself so many times. Like, if you're not ready for that, don't get started. And particularly, don't start taking other people's money. Then use your own funds. But like, if you need to understand what that means, talk with people with scars from having been in war. Talk with those that have built successfully companies and has sort of have gone through kind of that entrepreneurial experience. And there's many of them. Just kind of really be sure you understand that and you're ready for that. Culture fit. 
um, make sure um, sort of like like I I like sort of to to be surrounded by honest people, by people that are no bullshit people. I don't really like too pushy behavior where people tell me like, well, I have 10 investors, like, and if you don't move tomorrow, like I'm off, like, I want to be able to spend time with you. I want to find out like, because we're getting married, right? Like we're, we're partners in your business and your business is most likely your life and a big part of your life. So I want to make sure that we tick and we come along with each other and you see how Bitcraft fits together with you. So pushy behavior, for example, is one thing that really like is, is nothing that I'm sort of particularly uh, happy with or sort of um, gets me excited. And, and I typically say like, no, nah, that's, that's not for me. Uh, street smartness, like there is so much stuff out there. We're in this beautiful time where most of what you need, if not all of what you need can be found simply by using Google, right? I mean, let me Google this for you is such a beautiful kind of site actually. Like, like you can like, we can skip this whole thing here and I can give you five search terms and you will find everything I'm saying here on, on Google. Just street smartness for me is the representation of somebody who uses everything he has around him and at his disposal to get smarter, to get faster. Um, with, and, and like using Google is free. Like, like this, this experience when, when I built my first company in the late 90s, that wasn't available at all, right? Nowadays, you have all that at your disposal. Make use of that. And then product, product, product. I'm like, and maybe that is something that entrepreneurs more than not are about. For me, like seeing your product, touching the product, getting to really understand like how does the user experience work and kind if of how does it deliver that edge and, and kind of make me, my gamer eyes shine and get me get me that fun experience or make my life better um, or make my, my make still my life easier. Like that's what I'm really kind of love focusing on. And that's it. Now I'm done. I hope that made some sense. I'll look if there is any other question. Uh, do we get the slides from Jens? Yes, I think you will get them. Super, thanks a lot, uh, Jens. Um, that was like going in big time information. Um, so time to also get the discussion started now. Um, we also have um, still a game presentation, but please other investors, is this something do you follow? Is that um, the same you think about um, A and B, where do you see potential uh, means of combina combining? Um, perhaps I'll take that question first back to Jens, like your equity fund, um, how attractive is it for you if a company has say public funding, ran a successful crowd investment or has a project um, fund running um, or whatever other source it is. So, so since we're sort of equal partners with the entrepreneur because we're, we're sort of sharing um, company equity with him, we're kind of equally open to any other financing means, means that might be available to fulfill a certain objective for the company and ultimately create shareholder value and make the company a more successful company overall, right? Like, like that's what it boils down to. And whether that's project financing on top, uh, whether that's sort of a, gov a government fund that we might partner with, I think sort of for government funds, it's actually great to have sort of dedicated kind of fund, uh, institutional fund investors to partner with. Uh, we see ourselves as such partner um, that kind of can validate deals, can bring deals and bring international experience and partner with sort of um, uh, such funds. So, so we're, we're very open and very happy. And we see that in many of our companies that, that sort of uh, these different types of financing and different kinds of type, types of financing structures are combined. So um, absolutely open and, and agnostic to that. Um, I'll take the question of Jochen in a second um, to the other investors. Like, when does it start to get complicated? Like, when it's a marriage, it usually is, or traditionally is a one on one situation. Uh, Jens used the term, but if there's many people involved, it gets like a <laughs> Pariser Kommune um, quickly. Um, so, what's your take on that, Peter Bertrand? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. in, in the <clears throat> but when does it get complicated? What? Yeah, yeah, you know. Like how many investors, partners uh, do you think are potentially too much um, in a project? I mean, so there's a, I don't think I've heard of someone doing, I mean, okay, no. 
in in project based investment there, there are examples and solutions for many angels being part of one project based so like indie game fund ran uh, probably still runs a thing where like private people join up and then they all fund a part of one game uh, and they all write little separate contracts and i don't know how they do that tax wise but it somehow works uh but I've, I've, I've met a lot of studios that run into the issue that they've taken someone's money and then that contract says that we are recouping first and then they want someone else's money and then they also want to recoup first. And then sometimes that is sold, but usually one party is just bought out, but that is based on just project-based financing or with publishers. As for equity, I don't think we really cross path unless you have some preferable uh, shareholder thing that says you have the dividends on profit but but i don't think equity and project-based financing uh, yeah it, it's not the same thing <laughs> we don't we don't compete for the same stuff yeah there is no overlap on this if i can uh if i can chime in on this usually a full, fully uh equity based investors like to work with equity based and other other equity based investors and project financing folks like to stick with other project financing folks so to give you an example we're signing two games right now with uh two publishers um because it matches well you know there is basically the royalties split uh, that it was going to, uh, to be happening between the studio, between the publisher and us. Whereas, uh, you know, the obviously an equity base or full equity investor wants, uh, doesn't really like publishers or doesn't really like too much uh, any cash going out of the company. The cash out of the company is always something that reduces uh, the EBIT. And when your EBIT reduces, uh, so does your valuation. So we have simply different objectives. I you know, if an if an equity based investor has a company that they bet make a five year, eight years bet on, and they they invest a million, and they think that in eight years they will get uh, something worth I don't know fifty or hundred million, then they're probably not going to mind the publisher uh, with the few millions that will come out of the company. Uh, there's no overlaps. Um, there's not much of a conflict, but to make a deal from the get-go with a project financing entity and an equity investor it's probably not going to be a super good match because one company invests cash uh, there's a cash in and the other one is also a sort of cash in but then there's quickly a cash out on short term so those those uh objectives are indeed in contradiction so to make it simple basically work either with full equity investors and they can make them out around a financing round with only equity investors or do one uh, only with uh, project financing entities for your for your first project. Cool, thanks. Um, there's a question by uh, Jochen um, to all investors. So, what impact has remote working for your decision, given the actual and ongoing situation, meaning screen time instead of uh, meeting personally, and especially how do you handle that then if we're talking about bigger tickets in AA? triple a or vr projects anybody wants to take that jens basically said already he doesn't care it's his everyday life Pe peter peter wants to carry on he wants to he wants to answer that question i know it peter Well, maybe if Peter doesn't want, I can. I mean, I can Sorry. start if you want me, you Michael. Meant you, which Peter you meant? Me no. or or the other? No, <laughs> the the your your pera. So pe, pere, right. you actually have to say it pera, pera. Uh, but you know, Peter, Peter for landfall. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Well, my, I have a I have a bad connection, so I hear like half of what is being said. So I don't. I no, can't. basically, the question is, what impact has remote working on your decision? The fact that. What is it, what is it going to be your opinion if you have to invest in a in a production that is fully remote because of COVID nineteen? It does it have a negative impact, or does or you don't care? Like that's the question. Uh, I think most projects right now are somewhat remote. I have not I have not have any strong opinions for or against remote companies. Uh, I think I think the future is probably remote, and everyone should probably figure out how to do that effectively. Uh, but uh. But yeah, I've seen great projects on remote. I've seen great projects on, on local. I think both is fine. 
Yeah, it's totally fine. Uh, Jochen, uh, to, to give you an answer, we are uh, we're going to invest in a production that was entirely remote. It actually never went on site anywhere. And it's they they're they, to, to to even give more detail to your question. They're two brothers in Italy, and they have no money. They have literally no money. They've just been staying home, uh, and they're doing the game to honor the death of their father. Their father died, and they're making a game in the honor of uh, you know in in remembrance of their of their father. And it has to be one of the best prototype I've ever got into my hand you know it's basically the best playable i've ever received at this stage you know it's it's a it's a pre-alpha game it's polished it's got beautiful art uh great animation they have no cash and they've been staying home so it it actually plays no role at all and to give you uh, maybe to a final point to that question or complementary information we're getting absolutely spammed right now by family offices or other uh, investing entities during covid because our industry is very 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 much hermetic to the issues that the world is facing right now meaning you can produce a game staying in your basement i'm obviously making a character you know of this but you can obviously you can work remotely with teams you can make a game remotely you can market your game remotely and you can make money remotely because you don't need to go to the bank to get that to get the cash so it has on our end it has absolutely no impact, uh, and we have uh, we have different active productions right now, and we're actually very wary and cautious when they say uh, we want to get back on site. We're pretty much discouraging this at this stage and saying you should probably work from home. Uh, so it's actually a positive thing that you can work from home and get things done from home. Yeah. Just so, wanna... so let me... Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just want to quickly jump in here, just uh, kind of providing a little bit of the Kickstarter perspective, especially from the working from home standpoint. Um, first of all, Jens, that was amazing. That was like, I was like, I could listen to him talk all day. Very, very <laughs> passionate and inspiring. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that's been really interesting on Kickstarter, something that we get asked pretty much daily, Michael and I both, um, how COVID has affected Kickstarter. And it has been, uh, I feel a little bit conflicted about this for a couple of reasons, uh, but we have some of the best numbers that we've seen since the history of the site. Um, working from home has sort of allowed people to like really kind of dial into uh, much more of a creative process. It's allowed them the time and the space to really kind of like build uh, different types of games. Obviously the tabletop space has been massive. Um, but I think the other thing to think about is just from a consumer standpoint is that because everyone is home uh, and because I think at this point we've watched everything that exists on Netflix and Hulu and the various streaming services, people are looking for new content. And so Kickstarter is a place where people can find that new content. Uh, and because games at the end of the day are just, you know, essentially vessels to, uh, you know, kind of tell stories. Um, that's what people are looking for more than anything. Thank you. Um, I... Just two, two comments, if I, if I may add, uh, Michael. Um, so, so first off, um, uh, Bertrand Petter, like fundamentally, I think I sort of agree. And that's what I um, like. It is not a 100% compatibility between the two different financing types. Yeah? Uh, that's why they are two different financing types. They have different objectives. Yet, like I think with, with what I sort of alluded to earlier, being in the equity um, in the companies means we're looking for the long-term kind of overall success of a company. Now, one IP being featured in a different financing form or shape uh, or a different setup might be something that's acceptable in the bigger picture. You know, I think that's that's sort of fundamentally what I what I want to say. I see it very, very, very rarely. I think I've seen it coming up one single time in the companies that we looked at. So it's absolutely nothing common. It's nothing that I would recommend at necessarily looking for. Uh, once you have sort of uh, you have a venture capital funding structure, external venture capital partners, you you might want to continue to look down that way. But like it's it's nothing that sort of legally conflicts it can be done uh, but it's also nothing that as you said is is necessarily very compatible um second point to the um COVID implications um and corona implications of working i think for the bigger and more complex kind of uh, productions um the um what what we're seeing with sort of the large 
publishers and developers that we sort of across the portfolio work with fairly often and co-invest with really often, we hear from them that sort of they're seeing a sort of productivity decrease of maybe about 10 to 20% across the board on their kind of larger and more complex productions. So they're seeing an impact to sort of the, the productions where you have like 50 plus people working on a project, like on a, on a more complex IP. Um, and they're looking forward to be able to go back to the office, but there is kind of smaller, um, there is smaller aspects of the business that work well in remote and maybe even better in part in remote. And so like, I think that the bigger theme is, yeah, we want to go back to kind of a physical workplace, uh, but want to preserve some of the opportunity and benefit of remote work that we have learned as well. For smaller studios, I think um, sort of getting forced in an environment where you might be saving even on office cost and travel and, and, and whatnot in an environment like this might work out to your advantage. Like again, like as an entrepreneur, always make the best out of every situation. And I've had a couple of st studios that said like, you know what, my output is with my team. And, and that's like the small studios of like, I don't know, five to 10 people is like same as before. Um, people are actually a bit more motivated right now for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm actually saving a lot of money on, on office, which I can use in, I don't know, another guy building another kind of feature or whatnot, right? So um, I, I think it doesn't have a dramatic impact on, on our industry. Um, coming back to the last point, overall, we are at large massive beneficiaries of what's happening out there right now. Um, as odd as that sounds, and as sort of bad as one could theoretically feel about that fact, Games are thriving. And speed is running. It's crazy. Uh, when we started, I thought like, wow, okay, we have two hours <laughs> how to fill this. Um, so um, we still have one presentation coming up and we have a quick hands up uh, from Petter I want to take and then um, it's Ina time. Oh yeah. So you were saying that um, it's rare for you to see companies to take equity to take uh, publisher money or equity funding to gems? No, I, I think the mix that, that you guys described before, like project-based project, project -based financing and, and sort of venture yeah. capital. Are, that's but but would problem. you say it's common to see uh, equity-based, equ equity-funded uh, companies take, uh, pu take on publishers? Mm, to a lesser extent. I think because to, equity based to, funding is like a thing that someone invented like a year or two ago, like no one was doing it until like super recently. Uh, no, that's not true. Okay. I mean, like it, it's been around for like basically for, I mean, like decades. It's just like something I, I, I'd say there, there was a wave where like you saw, I think there was two big waves that sort of I have the most recent memories of, of sort of equity based studio funding. For, for games companies. That was particularly mobile games, kind of the mobile games wave and also the social games wave, which sort of one was probably 2000, like what was like, yeah, end of the 2000s, right? Like was probably when we sort of saw these waves um, and that spawned a lot of studios, a lot of studios that were venture capital successes for many of the generalist funds. Now, after the sort of first wave of mobile games studio successes and social games studio successes came to an end, which was sort of basically the, like it, it's, it's, this, it's this sort of phenomena that will repeat itself in the future, by the way, um, like when a new platform spawns and that was the mobile platform, entirely new platform that kind of got larger than anything else. Uh, social games were basically a platform with a very new characteristic of like very, very social gameplay. This formed kind of this, this sparked waves of like, if you're the first to the platform, you abuse the fact that the platform is empty and has a certain beneficial user acquisition dynamic, you can create amazing equity value. And that's what investors invested in a lot. Um, uh, now, I'm talking about project-based investment. Like uh, we're getting a bit off topic. Like I, I'm, okay. I'm interested in when you said that uh, project-based investment occurred because I'm, I'm probably wrong. But in, for me as like, I was pitching games since like 2011 Project-based financing was just not an option. It was not something that anyone talked about at all. It was either equity or publisher or angel. Like that was it. But you're saying that you saw equity-based financing back then? So again, like- No, like, no equity, uh, project-based financing. Sorry. Okay, okay, now we're on the same page. So, <laughs> so um, um, no, I, I, I don't think I saw many people, if not like less than a handful of people that were open to kind of such facilities. I think sort of something that, 
I might have been seeing is like besides sort of project based finance, like cohort based financing. That's something that I see coming up like in, what in is the last cohort years. Based financing? Like, like they basically say, like, I'll pay you your customer acquisition cohorts, right? I'll oh, pay your okay. customer acquisition and recoup on kind of the revenues. I look yeah. at your data, I look at your metrics, and I kind of pre finance the next cohort. Like, that's an interesting thing, I think, uh, with more data driven games companies. That's something that I think. Is, is sort of a very, but but that's a different stage when you're pro, that, than your project. Like there, you need to have sort of passed the seed stage. You have to have metrics. You have to kind of positive CAC, CLTV uh, dynamic, and then that works. So so you guys come in before, and I'd say there hasn't been much like that before kind of 2010. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, he was calling me the new guy. I think you were doing this, P, uh, Peter. Um, because basically in, in, Project. Did I call you paid. the new guy. When did I call you the new guy? What? Well, with with the with the you know with the fact that if you take a look at uh, the different options that you have for equity based in investment in the industry, you have much more options. You know, ranging from uh, makers to play to bitcraft to and then if you take a look at project financing investors, which are not publishers, then you don't have that many entities. And if you take a look at the market today. Uh, you're probably gonna hear either about Kowloon or you're going to be about us. So I guess it is what you were highlighting. The, is it is that project financing itself, when it's not linked to services, uh, aka a publishing deal, is something that is that is emerging right now as a new option. Talking about the new, um, so let's, um, Jens said he needs to run. Um, I guess he's still listening in parallel somehow. And I need to go into Dev Booster meeting sharp at 4 p.m. So um, Ina is the, um, has the good opportunity to sort of not only close the round, but also um, I guess her topic is the most compatible with everything we heard so far. Um, public money is always happy about co-money, right, Ina? So um, please take it away. I'm not unpolite. I just need to do something for two minutes. I'll also be right back. I <laughs> Sorry for that. Well, I think I'm going to uh, share my presentation, right? So maybe, Michael, don't run away until <laughs> it really works because... Don't feel pressured at all, sharing a presentation. Um. Um, that's again on the on the host. Um, he will do that in a second. It should okay. be uh, it should work already. Okay. But when I look at the selections I can share. I don't find, wait a minute. I don't find PowerPoint to be an option. Okay, it's always best to share a screen instead of only a window. Okay. Um, that uh, makes it a lot easier in, in Zoom. The thing is, I'm just like sitting on my laptop. I don't have a second screen. So I don't know what's gonna open. <laughs> That's fine. Just try it out. Oh, um, also, um, while um, not to um, like have everybody watching Ina oh, okay. um, and <laughs> just talk over and uh, we're waiting for PowerPoint, which is always the joke was always PowerPoint at conferences. It just doesn't work. And now magic. Thank you, Ina. So there magic. you are. And now you should probably Yes, you just press F5 and then you should be going. And now we see like the full yes. full screen, right? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I think we still have time. And I do want to give our audience the chance to get to know the new public funding in Germany. And basically, like I told you before, like the big uncapped fund just started a month ago, like exactly a month ago, where there is no cap on production of money. And basically, um, it's like um, my investor colleagues told before, it's like um, um, funding that usually public funding goes into projects. So it's never really something that you would see that goes into, into companies, but they rather put the 
the risk on uh, individual projects. And basically everything what Jens said before is um, of, of course true and I can only emphasize it. It's kind of like do your homework and research it. And because this public fund, you know, like questions like Jens mentioned, like you have to know where they're coming from, what is the aim of the fund. Um, so this fund is basically taxpayers money. So you can imagine it's quite conservative in the terms of, you know, how they protect the taxpayers money and how they evaluate stuff um, so they will you will have to write kind of a big application but that shouldn't like stop you of doing it because actually there's a lot of money in like I said before it's 50 million budget for every year and so far until 2024 but um, yeah that's not going to stop there. So this is just the beginning of the history um, of the game changer in financing games in Germany. Just a little quick, as I said, I'm working for the game, the association of the German games industry. So we were the ones, you know, representing all of our members. This is just like a and, and yeah, some some of them. That's not even all. We have 320 members, like in the in the core is developers and publishers, but um, we have many more actors in the German scene. So we are the association that we're lobbying for the games fund. Yeah, for our members, for the developers, for the German game scene. But the fund actually is located at a state ministry, the state ministry of transport and uh, infrastructure. So when we talk about, uh, yeah, because this is a fund for games made in Germany and I wanted to show you and I think, I think like I said it before in the beginning, um, this, those were the three games that were nominees for best German game just this year, the, the show was in, in April, just on the first wave on Corona. Um, so you can see here Anno, who eventually um, was the winner, but the other two games um, collected many awards because they were highly acclaimed. So for sure, Through the Darkest of Times and Sea of Solitude, um, two very special games that kind of made history in the way they were pushing the genre and they were um, for sure made um, in part or like um, possible to produce because there were, uh, yeah, German funds, uh, game funds involved. Like for example, here it was median board for Berlin Brandenburg, the game fund. So yes, like I said, even you could say like the three most best German games were like over half were already funded. So it's pretty important for the German game scene. I mean, this is the numbers. I just wanted to pull them like to, to kind of set the mood, but you know, everybody knows it. And as already Jens was mentioning, the games market, is just a, it's just a dynamic market. Uh, we all know it, it's growing and growing and there's so much potential. So um, yeah, of course we were ha happy that we could finally convince the German government to acknowledge that and yeah, further foster it. This is just to see how we all started because you know, there were countries like Canada that had tax credits since many years. You know, they erected this in 1997. Our partner, like next door countries, um, France and UK had put those tax credits out. So there was a lot of activities in different, you know, states of really subsidizing the games industry. And we always said, you know, we, it's more expensive to actually produce a game in Germany. So we really have to rise up to play within a level playing field. So this is just some numbers from 2019, but you can see now with the 50 million, we are rising um, yeah, to this level playing field. Like I mentioned before, this is just like a graphic, it's kind of in German, but it just gives you a very short, quick overview, which states in Germany offer public funding and the darker the blue, <laughs> the more money is, is in, the, um, in the pot. But as you can see, I mentioned before, you know, the amounts of money available is compared to this big um, federal games fund rather slow, but it's a great way to start a company. Those are great um, institutions really to connect, to get your first, first experience with the funding. And they offer much more than money. They offer a network and they offer different programs. You actually get more than money out of it by um, you know, checking out those regional funds and they depend wherever your like, games company is located. So you can only access them if you like work there or you have your um, company there. So yeah, like 
in November 18 was the big day in Germany for our uh, games companies um, where the, for the first time we could start this fund. So this is like kind of how, how young the fund is. And like I said before, just yeah, two months ago, actually it was just announced, announced and launched um, by the minister of the Ministry of Digital Infrastructure and Transport. This is where it's located the allocated the budget. So they have two main goals. They want to strengthen Germany as a strong location for games. You know, they want to attract businesses, um, you know, that, you know, German companies grow. There will be more German, you know, companies um, that will be started and more jobs in the German games um, scene. So everything just, you know, like a big boost for the whole um, company And like I said before, this is kind of the origin where this all came from, just to increase the international competitiveness. So just a really quick rundown, because I was given not many minutes. So what is to be funded? Basically, projects, like I said before, in the phases of prototypes and productions. But what's also really interesting, and that's kind of new in the public, for the public field, that they also do findings like substantial portings, meaning like, for example, you already like published a game for PCs, and like you're interested to put them, to bring them out for the consoles, this would be possible for them too. And also extension, meaning like DLCs, you know, you want to continue your game, which has been successful, this can be funded. So yeah, the prototypes, they already start at 30,000 euros, like that's the total cost. And this is when you kind of can enter the application and they're capped, but the production funding is not capped. It already starts for projects that cost 100,000 euros. So this is kind of like, it was important for us so that, you know, small companies can also participate, but then it doesn't have a cap. So like also AAA productions can um, apply just as well. So who is to be funded? And this is interesting for everyone that's joining us, us um, outside from Germany and considering maybe to move here for this big opportunity we offer. So you should, you can have open and headquarter here, but you can also open just like a business premise, you know. So this is um, possible too. Yeah, and it's um, legal entities with a like, li like limited liability. So this is a lot of works. Basically, I will give you the rundown. It's a grant, so that's great. It's not a loan. They will take no equity. There will be no um, paying back anything because this is a grant. It's simply dedicated to your game. And um, like I said before, you know, when it, the games cost until 2 million, it's 50%, then it decreases and every game like that costs more than 8 million euros uh, can be funded up to 25% in a grant. And yeah, like I said in the last uh, sentence, it can be added with other subsidies even, but you always have to find the other 50% um, somewhere else. You either bring it yourself, you have investors, you have publishers, you have money from Kickstarter campaigns, so this can be, can be matched. First part is interesting because this fund does not have a jury that's very new to Germany because all those regional funds will have certain deadlines. And then there's a jury looking like, a, you know, on a portfolio of projects. So this doesn't happen here. There is no deadline. You, so you can like every day you can turn on your application once your project is ready and has the finance, the resources, the concept and the people ready. So you can apply. And, but you have to pass a so-called cultural test. And this is something that, um, of course, that comes from the EU. And that means, you know, they want to foster the diversity of games uh, made in Europe. So it has to, it has to do something with like um, German or European culture in a very broad sense, either like content wise or your team, um, you know, has connections to Germany. Because of course, like I said, um, and Jan said before, do your research, where is the money coming from, from the tax player and the states wants to foster the German games industry. And yeah, we made a service because there's no English um, information available on the, on the, you know, on the official side from the ministry. So we um, translated the regulations for everyone not speaking 
um, German that well, even though, of course, I recommend to uh, eventually employ someone that's like a fluent German speaker because it, you know, it does mean dealing with bureaucracy and not even we Germans understand sometimes maybe <laughs> in the first try what they mean. So this is um, how you can contact us or contact me. I really want to emphasize we have we made put those great uh, the German games industry guide um, together with a lot of numbers and facts. And um, so you can get a lot of insights about how we work. So thank you very much, Michael. I hope I was. Sehr gut, Ina. Danke schön. Um, there's a lot of opportunities here. There's a lot of challenges also combined uh, with it. Um, like the public funding is, it seems easy money, but um, there are a lot of nitty gritty details. Um, we will go into those details tomorrow with Ina. Um, I just heard, Michael, close this meeting. It's needed for the next. Um, these are the new challenges of 2020 as well. Um, the other speakers can't stand on the stage and sort of push me off politely. I get shouted by on text messages and need to close um, sharply Zoom meetings. That's um, what we have to do now. Unfortunately, I think there would be a good discussion also going on amongst you people here on stage. But that's what we have the Discord channel for. Um, so there's the speakers lounge. Um, feel free to um, mingle around there and hopefully um, show yourself also in the lobbies we provide so that people can ping you directly. I would really love to have like the usual closing, but time's running. I need to just say thank you very much and please wave and we'll see you around. Thank you, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.